Hello, JSN Network. To our colleagues and friends, welcome to your presentation today. I'm Michael Muki Cruz Vanalili, a practicing psychotherapist and involved in several research projects here at Boston College. I'm very excited uh, to continue our programming in terms of excelling as an Ignatian educator uh, in today's global world. And today we'll be taking a pivot to learning how to care for the caretakers. I'm sure it's been a crazy year uh, for you all navigating a lot of different things and uh, right the understanding of what it means to nourish ourselves so that we could be of better service to others has been in the forefront of your mind. So today we'll be diving into it, uh, understanding a little bit more about self-care through neuromindfulness and actually Ignatian spirituality. So very excited to dive into it with you all today. So as I typically do with my reflections uh, or presentations, I'll invite us into a bit of reflection. So wherever you are finding yourselves at this current presentation, I invite you to allow the memories to kind of come to the surface of your mind as I ask these questions maybe drawing from your own personal experience, any of the colleagues you interact with, or any of the students whom you teach and mentor. One, how do you think psychological distress translates into embodied effects for us and our students? What psychological factors might we be grappling with in the midst of our profession, in the midst of our students' lives, in the midst of our colleagues' lives? And do we think that it's all just in our mind? Secondly, what do Christian mindfulness traditions have to offer us in terms of practice? And this phrase might be very interesting even for, for each of y'all, right? Mindfulness and the Christian tradition typically is not the first association. So what can it offer us in terms of being more grounded and more mindful? And of course, uh, speaking to folks here in the JSN network, right? Uh, how can Ignatian spirituality help us become more aware, particularly towards our students, right? What might the Ignatian tradition offer us in terms of diving in and finding God in all things? So by the end of this, brief presentation, I'm hoping that you each gain some familiarity with being able to explain how psychological distress translates into bodied responses for the human person. Uh, additionally, in the second part of this presentation, I'm hoping that we can begin to expand the concept of prayer towards an understanding of breath practice uh, and ways that we can actually unite that with our attentions and value. And hopefully you begin to see that this is actually uh, a way of nourishing us uh, even uh, right through our stressful times. Finally, uh, I hope that each of you will gain some familiarity in being able to apply the steps of the Ignatian examine, which will conclude with our third section, as well as understanding the disposition that each steps invite us towards. So first we begin with a little bit of psychology, stress, neuroscience, right? And typically when I speak to my students about neuroscience and I might even ask uh, you to reflect, if I say the phrase neuroscience, what might be the first associations that come up in your mind? Maybe the idea of a brain that kind of floats in a vacuum right behind our skull. Um, but I like to remind people that neuroscience is the study of actually connections. It's the study of the nervous system, which means the study of our whole embodiment, right? So even within the brain, there are neurons that connect, uh, connecting the different distinct regions to each other, uh, right? And in uh, neuroscience, there's kind of a saying, uh, neurons that fire together, wire together, hinting at the fact that continued practice and experiences actually help shape some of the synaptic structuring of our neurons, especially in early childhood and adolescent. That's definitely for another presentation, but all that to say that our lived experiences quite literally 
shape some of our brain structure, especially in these formative times, right? A powerful point of reflection and responsibility for us who are involved in the education and caretaking of these little ones. So all that to say that, right, the brain is very malleable even into our mid twenties in terms of uh, the ability to be shaped structurally. However, throughout the life course as well, there is a sense of plasticity, meaning that the brain can be shaped, uh, although not in a structural way, maybe in a functional way as well, right? Additionally, neuroscience doesn't only mean a brain floating in the vacuum, right? I like to show this image to remind us that it is connected to the rest of our embodiment. Right, that idea of embodiment and connection you'll see will actually be very integral to what it means as we reflect upon caring for the caretaker. Right. So with nearly 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion connections, the human brain indeed remains one of the great mysteries in science. And I hope to unpack a little bit of that mystery with you each today in terms of how we respond to stress. So again, taking that concept of neuroscience and our brain as a sense of connections, right? Within the neurons that fire and wire together within our own very brain, but now to the rest of our embodiment, to the rest of our body. So in terms of uh, nervous system basics, uh, I'd like to invite you to, if you take nothing else from this, uh, to see that there are certain things that trigger our stress response system. So when I speak of the nervous system, uh, it's typically delineated into two portions, right? As we talk about our brain and also connected to the spinal cord, and this is the central nervous system. A little bit of a uh, fun facts for uh, you each. You might either recall some feelings of back when you were in grade school and you had butterfly in your stomach feelings whenever your crush was around you, that is a stress response, right? There is something called the vagus nerve, vagus meaning Latin for 10, uh, that connects all the way from your brain stem down to your gut. And that butterfly in your stomach feeling is a precortical, a precognitive uh, kind of loop that notes, hey, there is something stressful or exciting here in front of you, right? Um, so that is a little bit of even your nervous system at work, right? And of course, it connects with the rest of our embodiment into our extremities uh, through the peripheral nervous system. Now, when we encounter a stressor, it might trigger one of two of our stress responses. The parasympathetic nervous system response or the sympathetic nervous system response. All that to say that if you take nothing else from this slide, uh, the parasympathetic nervous system response decreases our heart rate and recruits these reactions within our body. This is typically a calming response. You might imagine trigger, triggering this during relaxation periods, right? Meditation as we see from our zebra friend over here, uh, sleep, lounging with your friends and or family members, right? That sense of calmness and restoration might be triggered. And you can see, right, there's definitely hints at some of the practices that we will be doing uh, in the following segments. The flip side of that is the sympathetic nervous system response, which increases your heart rate and recruits all of these functions. Now in popular psychology, this might be considered the fight or flight response or the fight, flight or freeze, depending on the literature that you are reading. All that to say that when a stressor prompts this response, it cues your body to do something about it with that stressor, right? That's why we have our zebra friend running over here. Now, you might begin to imagine what the linkage is here in terms of the embodied stress response system that we have. And one of the interesting things that humans can do that other animals can't, things like imagination, things like creativity to the extent that we can, 
like things like spirituality. All of these things, our zebra friends, even though they have the same mammalian nervous system, um, we function just a little bit differently than them. So a real question that we might want to think about is, although we have the same stress response system as other mammals, especially our, our zebra friends, uh, why don't they get ulcers? <laughs> and why do humans get them? Uh, taking a note from uh, a tongue-in-cheek title uh, by Dr. Robert Sapolsky, um, we'll unpack some of the insights that we have in this book as we apply uh, our understanding uh, of neuroscience to psychological distress. And then we will pivot that uh, to spiritual practice that might uh, diminish that sympathetic nervous system response. Again, uh, the book by Dr. Robert Spolsky, While the Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, I highly suggest uh, that you read. He has a couple of other uh, current books as well, like Behave Human Beings at Our Best and Our Worst. So a little bit about our stress response and some of the hormones that are associated with it. Right, as Dr. Sapolsky notes, a stressor is quite literally anything in the outside world that knocks you out of homeostatic balance. For example, if you are a zebra in the savanna, right, you might see a lion and evolutionarily and properly, your stress response, your sympathetic nervous system stress response will trigger giving you a rush of epinephrine or adrenaline, as it's known here in the United States, uh, to have their fight or flight response. You are probably going to be flighting or fleeing from said line. However, this can also be triggered by the anticipation or the fear of that happening, right? So if you see a tall blade of grass and you're a zebra, you might begin to see a shadow. And even before you see the lion, you might expect or anticipate something happening in which that also triggers your sympathetic nervous system. You can begin to see how for human beings, that same embodied stress response system doesn't really work well when you're thinking about your student loans or you know maybe all of the work that you have to do, right? And you're Shoulders might hunch over, you might get that feeling in your gut, right? You might uh, have your tongue closer to the roof of your mouth as opposed to the bottom of it, which maybe y'all are doing right now, constantly hunch and stressed over, right? So these same embodied responses can be triggered even for psychological and social stressors. So in terms of hormones released, right, as I noted, epinephrine and adrenaline is typically the ones that is noted in popular psychology. However, there are also uh, the release of glucocorticoids, which back up the stress response system over minutes or hours. It's released through the HPA axis. Uh, so sorry, sorry for using the acronyms, but that is the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal gland axis that kind of trigger when you have that stress response. And remember, right, our understanding of full embodiment in which the brain connects to the rest of our body, right? So as he notes, uh, Dr. Sapolsky notes that epinephrine acts within seconds, but glucocorticoids back this activity up over the course of minutes or hours. <laughs> so in terms of psychological distress, as we kind of noted in the beginning, is it just all in your head? Um, so what Dr. Sapolsky notes is the fascinating thing that, right, the stress response is fantastic for prompting a burst of sudden energy to deal with said stressor. The problem is psychological stress or psychological distress does the same thing within our body, even though we have no physical reason whatsoever. So you can begin to see the double-edged sword of human's ability to imagine, to be creative, right? To have spirituality and future thinking and all of that. Those things in terms of the social and the psychological could also stress us out and trigger this stress response. Now, this list is not exhausted, but exhausting, it might be exhaust, 
being not exhausted, there you go, of the psychological factors that he observed during his research. Dr. Sapolsky studied uh, baboon troops, but then he also studied kind of human beings. Um, but then he also draws literature in terms of mammalian neuroscience, rodents, and other things like that. Notes the, the one factor that helps uh, garden diminish against this is actually social supports, right? So if you might have some psychological stressor happening in your mind, um, you might end up right reaching out to a friend, colleague, maybe your partner to chop it up, to chat. In essence, helping diffuse that sense of psychological distressor between two people, right? And of course, things like the embrace, things like breaking bread together, things like being in community, help give you a sense of that social support, right? So you might be thinking of how might we help nourish our colleagues, our students, our coworkers in times of psychological distress, right? Social support continues to be one of those things that emerge in the literature. Additionally, the second and third factors are predictability and control. So, right, this is uh, typically uh, taken from uh, things like rodent studies in which uh, there is kind of a, a Pavlovian shock response, right? They might play a sound and then <laughs> a shock might happen, a stressor might be induced. Um, but actually, if you change the timing of when the tune and the shock comes, if you make it erratic and unpredictable, they actually find more glucocorticoids in the bloodstream of those creatures. So what does that note, right? Having a sense of unpredictability, either in our work structure or maybe our lesson planning might create some psychological distress uh, for our students, right? So what does it mean to structure and have a clear kind of understanding of how we might be proceeding might help diffuse some of that psychological distress. So that's for predictability. A sense of control, a sense of agency. This is also found in the literature in terms of when creatures feel like they are able to do something, some of that stress uh, right, might be diffused. So again, maybe thinking in terms of the folks that we serve, how do we integrate some of their agentic function, some of their creativity, so that they feel like their voice is being heard, so that they feel like they have some sense of control. Right? That sense of agency and control is important in diminishing psychological distress. Finally, the perception of things worsening, right? And actually, especially in the third section of this presentation, we'll talk about Ignatian spirituality and right how we might even begin to use our imagination to help guard against this. But because of the way that human beings are able to both future plan and imagine, the perception of things worsening can actually trigger a stress response in the moment right, in which we are triggering that fight or flight or that sympathetic nervous system response. So again, these are not exhaustive, but these are factors that you might begin to consider, ah, how might I both in my own life, as we're caring for the caretaker, but for the folks whom we serve, create preconditions to diminish the effect of extreme psychological distress. So as we kind of pivot towards uh, the mindfulness aspect of it, right? We are talking about how psychological distress might trigger the sympathetic nervous system response, right? But what about the other side of the house, right? How might we trigger the relaxing uh, side of the house, right? So again, because this is a brief presentation and I wanna be mindful of y'all's uh, time, mindful, uh, I am just linking this article here. We'll be deriving very, very brief insights, but if you're interested in the neuroscience behind mindfulness, I highly invite you to dive into the literature by Dr. Vago and Dr. Silverspeig. I find this framework very helpful, and they actually move us through a bit of the literature in terms of neuroscience and mindfulness. Additionally, right now, we are expanding our understanding of the person, not only from the brain, right? and the connections therein to the rest of the nervous system, but also, right, to things like our breath, our lungs, our heartbeat, right? Being a, very much aware of how uh, we might begin to utilize this understanding of breath 
And as we walk through these presentations, you'll find that breath is actually very integral to what it means to enact spirituality. So all that to say, just helping distill some of their findings for you in this very pithy statement. Um, prolonged practice in terms of mindfulness can actually decrease sympathetic nervous system response and increase parasympathetic nervous system response. Our decrease, our fight or flight, uh, our zebra friend running in the savanna and increase our ability to relax ourselves. And again, this is from prolonged practice, right? So this is definitely something much like going to the gym, much like maintaining your friendships, much like all of these practices, cognitive understanding of it uh, is very different than, than living into it, right? But increased ability to trigger these uh, kind of theta uh, or restorative uh, states um, allow us to begin to care for the caretaker uh, as we guard against some of the stress responses. Before we pivot into the next part of the presentation, just some takeaway and resources for you each tonight. Our bodies react through a stress response when triggered by a perceived stressors. And the interesting thing here for human beings is that this is triggered even by psychological ones. Additionally, prolonged and chronic activation can lead to unhealthy effects. Or as Dr. Sapolsky notes, it's not constant stress that will inevitably diminish your health, but the way that that utilizes our energy and our embodiment and weighs down on our system will give it its wear and tear in due time. Additionally, breath is closely tied to our embodiment and our nervous system. So in our next portions, we'll see how things that we trigger naturally and things like sleep and relaxation, we can do so through conscious effort by mindfulness practices. Again, please check out any of the resources. These slides will be made available to you, uh, as well as certain frameworks from Harvard University's Center on the Developing Child. They have great resources in terms of neuroscience, brain development, psychological stress, et cetera, et cetera. So as we pivot into the next portion of our presentation, I invite you to take a moment to take a look at this painting and kind of reflect on it, right? As we begin to talk about that idea of embodied breath, uh, it's very interesting that even in the Christian tradition, in the Jesuit tradition uh, of the network that we belong to, um, breath is very foundational actually to our understanding of human anthropology. Uh, from Genesis, the scripture reads, right, then the Lord God formed ha-adam, or red clay, from the dust of the ground, and breathed into the nostrils the nishma, or the spirit, which is typically translated, right, but it could also be translated as breathe in the breath of life, and the ha-adam became a living being. Right, so that idea that breath is very integral to what it means to be alive, to be animated in this world. And that idea of breath is what links us all the way from our birth, from which we take our first breaths outside the womb of our parent, to the last moments in which we give up our breath again, right? to give up your spirit back into the world. But that idea of breath being embodied will be very integral as we think about what it means to pray, right? The point of this part is to expand our notion of prayer and introduce breath, our very breath and living as acts of prayers. Also, if you stay towards the end of the presentation, I have a little bit of a surprise for you in terms of Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam. You'll notice it's very curious, right, that the creation of Adam, Adam is already, quote unquote, created, right? Adam's hand is limply reaching out to the ether. And uh, you might be uh, taking a look at uh, the god being's cloak over here as a, an oval shape. Might be similar to something that we just talked about tonight, right? All right, let's trace the idea of mindfulness in various religious, traditional, and clinical models. Again, my point here is to show you that mindfulness 
is not just a flat static thing, nor does it only belong in one tradition as we typically think. So whether Christian or otherwise, I invite you to dig into your traditions, to dig into your staff's traditions, your students' tradition for senses of mindfulness and breath practice that might invite us to ground ourselves, to nourish ourselves in a sense of value. Of course, the most popular linkage uh, in terms of mindfulness, at least in the United States context, are things like Buddhist traditions, right? So we have things like meditation or, and I apologize for any pronunciations I'm about to butcher, but bhavana, right? Which is actually different, different from mindfulness or smriti, um, right? And you see a sense of actually remembrance uh, over here. We'll see that some of those aspects can be examined. Additionally, breath practice in and of itself actually is considered pranayama or breath control. Additionally, there are roots within the Christian tradition as we'll find. The two that we'll be exploring and practicing today is hesychasm, which is Greek for stillness. So it's actually part of the Eastern, but this time the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition that practices stillness and breath prayer. And they have kind of uh, retained this through monastic periods within the early church. Additionally, there is the examine. And I'm sure this is something that y'all are very familiar with. So I won't dive too much into the history of that, but I'll show you just aspects of St. Ignatius's spiritual exercises to allow us to see how memory and reflection might actually invite us to better understandings of how to find God in all things. Additionally, if you're interested, there are other clinical applications, right? For myself as a, a therapist, uh, MBSR is probably the most popularized one or mindfulness-based stress reduction by Kabat-Zinn. But mindfulness is also beginning to be integrated into holistic medicine as of the past four decades, as you can kind of see here, right? So there is a sense of hungering uh, for not seeing the person as just a biological system, but perhaps something more as well. And of course, nodding at that idea of breath, right? If you actually take the words of things like prana, ruach, or nishma uh, as well, nevma, or nevma, yeah, uh, which is Greek for breath, suke, which is also to blow, for where we derive the root psyche or psychology, right? as well as spire, which is to breathe, which where you derive the word spirit, spirituality, inspiration. So even the root of things like psychology and spirituality is rooted in that sense of breath, of being alive and dynamism. So a little bit of a uh, brief on the idea of breath and spirit in Christianity. This could definitely be its own entire course. So I... Sorry, I'm distilling it down to slides for you. But again, an invitation for you to dive into uh, your own tradition, right? If this is a way that you can kind of dig into it from Christianity, you know, what else might you be able to find in it? Just in terms of the scriptural tradition, right? Uh, from Genesis, which we share with the Judeo-Christian tradition, that idea of breath, again, the breath of God, the Ruach Elohim that floats above even the chaos of creation prior to creating this world, right? The idea of breath and wind present even from the very beginning. And as we saw uh, in terms of the creation of Adam from the dust, it is the animated breath of life that breeds the person into life. Additionally, right, in terms of the gospel narratives, right, it might be kind of strange, uh, some of the passages but the idea of the resurrected Christ breathing on the apostles. And you might be like, that's a very strange thing to do. But right, if you translate the idea uh, instead of spirit as this kind of ghost or this like metaphysical thing, uh, right? It makes sense when Christ says, receive the holy breath, receive the divine breath of life. In the ancient period, a lot of the monastics would, you know, go to the desert and contemplate these things, right? Uh, folks like Evagrius of Ponticus would write in the schemata, right? The God who breathes into the kindred light. And there's a lot of mystics in this period who reflect 
in terms of Christianity and that idea of breath, right? In terms of the Middle Ages, there's a lot of other characters that could be mentioned, but Abba Philemon writes the Philokalia, which in the Greek means the love of the good. And it is a compilation of Christian texts that actually begin to utilize practices of mindfulness, right? So this Jesus prayer, we will encounter it later as we practice, but the idea of uniting prayer with your breath, as Nicophorus the solitary uh, invites people to do, right? So mixing in attention, breath, and prayer, right? As you begin to embody the things that you value, right? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on you. That's one of the eldest formulations of something called the Jesus Prayer. And then, of course, in terms of current, current trends, if you're interested in learning more about hesychasm, I invite you to take a look at Callisto's Ware. He is an English bishop and theologian of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Highly suggest some of his works. Very fascinating and accessible. Some of the work we'll be drawing on today is Martin Laird, right, who, in a, who is an Augustinian monk who teaches on ancient Christianity and some of its practices. Additionally, the way of the pilgrim, and this word pilgrim is also very uh, important to St. Ignatius, is one of the things that popularizes the Jesus prayer and what it means to pray with your breath as you journey. Additionally, in terms of the medical model, right, this form of diaphragmatic breathing or pranayama from the Buddhist traditions uh, has been popularized by folks like Dr. Andrew Weil. So we'll do a version of this 478 breathing technique, but we'll unite it actually with attention and prayer in just two slides. The 478 breath, the point of it is to begin to mimic a type of breath that we do when we sleep, when we enter into those parasympathetic nervous system response, right? When you are stressed or doing sports, your breath might come very short, very quick, rightfully so, as you are trying to trigger uh, the opposite side of relaxation. But as you relax, triggering it consciously and mechanically through your breath, right? Breathing in for four, holding it for seven in your diaphragm, and exhaling slowly for eight. Again, mimicking that sense of uh, breath that we do in our sleep will trigger the parasympathetic nervous system response. I'll leave this handout to you to read on your own time, of course. Tips for practicing breath prayer. So as we are practicing this breath prayer, and we'll take a couple minutes to do so again in the next slide, I invite you to find a comfortable space in your chair or your couch or wherever you might be doing this training. And it's a good idea to just take kind of four, uh, three to four breaths here, right? Allowing you, your embodiment to find its rooting, its feet on the ground, right? Allowing your body to feel the chair supporting you, your hands to maybe lay on the side over there your shoulders to slump, your diaphragm to open. You're just breathing in naturally, three breaths. Breathing in and slowly out. Breathing in and slowly out. More breathing in and slowly out. And in the following breaths after that, we would go into the 478 diaphragmatic breath, really focusing in on, if not four, seven and eight seconds, maybe three, four, six, just as long as the exhalation is slower and longer than the inhalation. Again, Father Laird invites us to hold breath like a cap in our hand, right? And then to combine a prayer word with your breathing. So for those coming from the Christian and Jesuit traditions, right, being able to utilize something like the Jesus prayer, your favorite Psalm, right? For those of us joining from other cultural and religious traditions, what might be some values you want to infuse in your very breath? And those are anchor words or anchor phrases 
that as you inhale, pause and exhale, you breathe yourself too. Of course, eventually these three will form a unity. You see a little bit of the Trinitarian theology there, right? But the idea that your attention, your breath, and your prayer actually come together and form a unity. And of course, when your attention gets stolen by thoughts, simply just bring your attention back to your breath and your word. Right? Those are things that help anchor you as you kind of allow the stressful thoughts and the rest of your thoughts to not constantly gain your attention. Of course, for many, this will be an uncomfortable and self-conscious practice, right? So this is quite common, as we noted, in terms of the neuroscience section, neurons that fire mm -hmm. together, wire together. So it definitely takes practice and habituation, but don't even allow the frustrated thoughts to be the thing that take your attention. So in this slide, we will practice. Behind this red screen, there is kind of a timer that prompts us to inhale, pause, and slowly exhale. And as you do this, I invite you to either dive into from the Christian traditions, Jesus prayer as you kind of unite that with each breath. Or if you would like, feel free to choose a Psalm, volume, or mantra that you would like to infuse with your very breath. So let us dive into it. Find a comfortable space in your chair, Maybe pick up your tea or your water. Take a sip. Right. If you're holding a warm beverage, this is uh, typically pretty easy to inhale, hold, and exhale. So if you don't have that with you right now, I invite you to do it in the morning, of course. But find a comfortable space in your chair and allow yourself just three natural breaths. Breathing in and out. And with each breath, invite yourself to go deeper into it, breathing in and slowly out. And the third time, breathing in, pausing and slowly exhaling. And as you inhale, we'll do this three times, breathing in, pause and slowly out. This time, feel free to utilize your mantra or your word, breathing in, holding, and slowly out. Twice more, breathing in with your word, and one final time. Of course, uh, I hope that you find some patience in yourself as for anyone trying this the first time, it might be a little distracting, uh, but I invite you to definitely stick with it. I wish that I can hear your feedback in terms of this breath prayer section, but hopefully our paths cross again, and I'd love to see if this practice takes hold in you. So in terms of breath prayer, some takeaways for this second section as we pivot into Ignatian spirituality. Spirituality and breaths are part of various traditions, also including Christian traditions. How might it be present in your own, right? This idea of mindfulness, right? Not just a blank slated, you know, kind of Panda Express washed out version of it, but a version that kind of roots you in your identity and in your values, right? What might it have to offer you in terms of bringing out and embodying your values, even with your breath and your lived actions, right? We pray without ceasing by uniting our attention, breath, and values. Here are some additional books if you're interested in learning more about Christian spirituality, right? Again, The Way of the Pilgrim uh, is one of the books that has popularized, at least in the uh, modern times, uh, the Jesus Prayer. Again, Martin Laird's Look into the Silent Land. It's a very fantastic and easy read. 
again, these two are probably some of my favorite saints, so I <laughs> list their books here, but this is what happens when a life, especially in even in the current United States, is infused with the idea of what it means to pour yourself out in service of others, right? Dorothy Day's Long Loneliness kind of talks about this in the Catholic Worker Movement. And even Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain talks about this uh, in terms of being a monk, right? What does it mean as this infused breath even moves us both to the interior life and to service in the margins as we are invited to in the Jesuit tradition? So as we pivot into Ignatian spirituality, I invite you to reflect on what this phrase actually means to you, right? In the Jesuit Ignatian context that we find ourselves in, we have a lot of buzzwords, right? We have care for the whole person or cure personalis, right? Which isn't just caring for ourselves as we talk about caring for the caretaker, but notice that idea of caretaker means that we care for ourselves in order to better serve others, right? The idea of modges, not just as a quantitative thing of how many projects, you know, how many honors can you get in your school system and as a leader, but what is the quality of work? What is the value and meaning that infuses, right, the type of modges you're doing for others? And this idea of finding God in all things, right, what does it actually mean to find the very breath of life in all of the things that we do? So for those of you involved in the uh, school system, right, uh, if not teaching, then administrative work, right, with your colleagues who are also teachers, I guess. So what is it about at least uh, the network and the systems that we find ourselves, whether community service or education, that you find meaningful? Like, where is God in this? And as we reflect in the next slide in terms of the life of St. Ignatius, right, Ignatius, again, the idea of pilgrim and journey and story breath is very important to Ignatius. So we'll dive into a little bit of that. And again, this falling in love uh, prayer poem by Father Joseph Whelan, which typically actually gets uh, attributed to Father Pedro Arupe. It's definitely in the spirit, in the breath of Father Pedro Arupe. But this idea of finding God uh, like you're falling in love, Right, the idea that it kind of colors everything you do, right? And that idea of gratitude. You'll see values of humility, gratitude, and indifference infusing Jesuit spirituality. So Ignatian spirituality, from Inigo to soldier, student, priest, to even a pilgrim, right? If you have the time, I definitely invite you to read the autobiography of uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. Again, this is a brief presentation, so I can't dive too much into it for you, but uh, hopefully this begins to pique your interest, uh, and I definitely invite you to, you know, dive deeply into it. Again, you might just see kind of buzzwords. You might see the guy, you know, maybe with a limp, with the cloak floating in the wind, right, as we typically do. We call him St. Iggy, I-G-G-Y, who that, who that, but his story is actually a very rich one, right? And I think you'll see that that prompts a little bit of how he forms the exercises, the idea that he actually lived into various chapters of his life, right? And at the end of the day in his autobiography, he just liked to refer to himself as a pilgrim, as a person journeying towards something, right? And you'll, you'll see this as we trace kind of the arc of his spiritual exercises. But the overview of the spiritual exercises, whenever you hear that word, it is actually uh, kind of instructions for directors to give a four-ish week silent retreat. And it's written like a formulaic book. It's typically at the end of any of the books you pick up of St. Ignatius's autobiography, right? There's also rich history of it. It has a lot of different versions, a lot of discernment, another buzzword that comes into it. Uh, in which the church and the early uh, society of Jesus kind of grappled with uh, which of these versions would kind of win out. Needless to say, even in all the versions, all four weeks kind of retain the same kind of structure in which week one typically reflects on that idea of sin, self, and God's grace. That as you kind of begin that idea of pilgrimage and story, 
much like Ignatius's own cannonball to the leg moment, right? That kind of prompts all of these reflections. We two episodes in the life of Jesus. So for Ignatius, it becomes the person of Christ, right? And Ignatius, during his bedridden days, he actually asked for books to read, you know, gallant novels about knights and things like that. <laughs> Needless to say, they just had the, the life of saint and the, the life of Jesus Christ. So uh, glad that the book collection was very <laughs> limited there. But yeah, that actually profoundly impacted him, right? And that's what kind of prompted him to, you know, kind of go on his pilgrimage and, you know, go into his studies and things like that. But for him, right, reflecting on the person of God in body, right, as a person to accompany, as a person to serve, uh, was very powerful. Week three is the Passion of Christ, right? So it's a very dark week, but a week that definitely invites uh, the exercitant, the person making the exercises, to reflect on what value is worth even, even living and dying for. And lastly, the resurrection of Jesus and God's love, which as we'll reflect, we find the susipe, right? The principle and foundation is found even before week one, and so is the daily exam. And that'll definitely be the highlight of this portion of the presentation. But you'll see that there's definitely a, a sense of structuring in terms of the spiritual exercises. Again, that idea of whom we are falling in love with, right? Or what is the end? What is, what is that goal of that love? So the principle and foundation. Again, this will be made available to you. So I highly suggest that you sit, contemplate, and definitely pray with this. But just something interesting things to think about, as this definitely informs the value of the JSN network, right? Of the context in which Jesuit spirituality is uh, infused with the principle and foundation of Ignatius, right? For Ignatius, everything is meant in order to praise reverence and serve our creator, right? And all things in this world are oriented towards that end. So you see the value of indifference over here right? Uh, we are able to utilize and enjoy those things insofar as they help us towards this end, but we actually must free ourselves from them if they move us away from developing into that person. So in the modern rendition, right, the uh, word of balance comes up, but in the translated version, it's translated as indifference, and this is where you get Ignatian indifference from, right? So Right, as long as we have kind of free choice and are not bound by our responsibilities, right? We can't be indifferent uh, to those who we are leading because we have a sense of responsibility to them. You can't be indifferent to your kids, right? Because they definitely have to eat and be cared for. But in so far as you can uh, be indifferent to the things that you have uh, free choice to, right? You should not want health, nor illness, wealth, nor poverty, fame, nor disgrace a long life or even a short one, right? Insofar as they all move us closer to our created end, again, which is to praise, reverence, and serve God. Notice actually over here uh, and over here, there's no mention of love yet, right? So the principle and foundation definitely begin from the abstraction, and this is in the beginning of the journey, right? And I, I want you to keep that idea of abstraction in the beginning as we move towards the susape, which is found at the very end of the exercises. The susape, which is found in the week four, the end of our, the exercises, is where we have the very beautiful song that we heard in the beginning, right? Take, Lord, and receive my memory, my understanding, my entire will. All that I have and possess, you have given all to me. To you I return it. Dispose of it entirely according to your will. Give me your love and your grace. That is enough for me, or that is sufficient for me. One of the translations that I really like is this idea of give me the grace to love you, right? So the point of that is there is actually one singular thing, right? Not your love and your grace, but you are asking for the grace to love, for that is enough for me. So by this portion in the exercises, Ignatius has identified love 
as the kind of final talos of it, right? So notice in the abstraction in the beginning towards the person of Christ, a human, uh, fully divine, fully human, of course, for those who have taken theology, but that human face of loving, right? So you begin to see these values infuse things like the Jesuit network, right? Where we are invited to be persons with and for others, to set the world on fire, right? Again, to be for the other. So how does the spirituality grounded in service to God through others inform you? Right? How does Ignatius's value of gratitude, humility, and difference inform how you operate in your context? So lastly, we end, of course, with the examine. And the examine, again, is found in the earlier parts of the spiritual exercises. But thinking of that arc, right, from principle and foundation to that idea of giving your yes in the service of others, right? Your entire being, your intentions, your breath. When we make the general examine, it is oriented right, towards being of better service to others. So again, right, a sense of mindfulness in which we are caring for the caretaker. But again, that phrase caretaker, meaning that we are giving that back to others. So the examine typically has five points, right? The first point is to give thanks to God for the benefits received. So you begin with a sense of gratitude, right? And the second point is to ask for the grace to know one's sins and reject them, right? So a point of humility. Now, sometimes point one and two get kind of flipped and that's, you know, totally okay. Over here, right, you'll see kind of an asking for grace and then asking for thanks, right? Uh, over here, right, relishing in the moments uh, and asking the Holy Spirit to lead you, right? So, but that idea of uh, gratitude, humility, grace as part of the first two points of the exam. Third point is definitely the meteor point of the exam, in which you are asked to account for one's soul from the hour of rising, hour by hour, to this present moment, right? Point four is when you ask for a kind of pardon, right? And as I guide you to the exam, I like to ground this in a sense of a reflection of a human face or a connection, right? Where might there have been a moment in your day where you might have wronged someone, you know, either self or others, but definitely how in your behaviors, you know, might have you made a mistake, could have been a more loving person. But that way it's not just about self, but self in relation to other, of course. And point five is to ask to be able to better engage in the world afterwards. So we'll engage with this examine as our final practice before we conclude and wrap it up. Again, y'all are probably very familiar with this examine, so I won't belabor the point, um, but I hope that grounded a little bit of your understanding of where this fits in the context of Ignatian spirituality, as well as the values and you know, the things that Ignatius would probably use during his breath prayer. But we'll begin with breath as we did in our previous presentation, and I'll guide you into an abridged version of this examine. So again, finding a comfortable space in your chair, as Father Martin Laird invites us, grounding your feet and opening up your chest so that you can breathe from your diaphragm, allowing your shoulders to relax and allowing you to just take three simple breaths, breathing in and out. Once more, breathing in and out. One final time, breathing in the breath of life, holding it and slowly exhaling. And allow yourself to begin to take a look at the point if it's not distracting to you. Allow yourself to close your eyes if that's easier for you as you imagine your day, but continuing to ground it in that steady breath as you breathe in, slowly holding and slowly out. Moving it from word to giving thanks as you inhale. and 
slowly exhale. Asking God for the grace of humility and light to breathe in. And out. Giving thanks as you review your day. Take a moment to gently close your eyes, to focus maybe on a point as you hold your breath and exhale and allow the memories of the day to resurface in your mind, calling the first thoughts that come as you awoke, were they thoughts of gratitude Rushed, stressed, worry, silence, morning coffee, the sound of your partner or your kids. What were the first thoughts that greeted you today? Tracing the next moments of your day. Did you go to work? Did you go to a place to study? Did you meet a friend to relax? What are some of the faces that come as you move from morning to midday? What conversations did you add in your mind? As you move from midday to afternoon, what meals did you have? Were they eaten with gratitude? Were they rushed? Were they eaten with a friend, a colleague? What faces did you encounter after? With the people you serve, your students, your coworkers? If you move from places, what spaces did you move to and from? What place are you in right now? As we move to point four, reflecting maybe on an interaction or a face that kind of sticks out to you, or you could have been more loving. What is it about this interaction that misaligns with your values? What could you do better next time? Just breathe in and out. Lastly, conclude by breathing in the breath of life, holding slowly out asking for the grace and the strength to be more loving as you continue your day. Breathing in and out. Again, I wish that I'd be able to hear some of the images and thoughts and persons that came up in your mind and your exam, but I suppose that is between you and God. So I Hope that that examine was helpful as a practice for each of y'all. So takeaways for this third and final section. Ignatian examine offers a way to relish, right? And to sift through our days, to find the God already present there, but something we might've missed as we are busily, psychologically stress stretching through our day, right? What might be grounding ourselves in some breath and then some reflection reminding you. Again, in the French, this comes out really beautifully, but the idea of savoir uh, or to savor, to taste, to relish is actually similar to knowledge, right? So that idea of relishing your day because there's some wisdom buried there. As Ignatius found this in his life, just like our breath, uh, right? This practice offers us 
space to remind ourselves of our purpose and our connection with others. Again, for other fantastic resources, I invite you to take a look at Journeying with Ignatius, uh, an app uh, by our friends at the Institute for Advanced Jesuit Studies, a uh, very wonderful way to learn about Ignatian spirituality. Additionally, right, these sources are accessible uh, references for some of Ignatius's original sources. And if you are looking for any form of reflective things, ignatianspirituality.com by Loyola Press has a bunch of fantastic things. As I noted, thank you all for taking the time to dive into neuroscience of psychological stress, all the way to Christian mindfulness and Jesuit spirituality. As I promise, here's a little kind of treat at the end of it all. Right, as I was noting, right, God's cloak kind of has a very strange and oblong-like shape. A neuroscientist by the name of Meshberger uh, noted this and did some uh, excavating. Michelangelo, like other artists in his times, was actually uh, did some work on cadavers. So this is a time in which neuroanatomy was kind of being found even by the artist community. Right, so this might be a nod that. Uh, human beings, right? The creation of Adam might be our ability to utilize our intention, align it with our breath and our embodiment, right? So that dictum of the idea of praying without ceasing, we can accomplish that by infusing our breath, our intention, with the very way that we live and serve in this world. Thank you, JSN colleagues, for tuning in to Caring for the Caretaker, Self-Care, Neuromindfulness, and Ignatian Spirituality. It has been an honor to learn, to pray, to do the exam with you. I hope that you find this information useful in terms of both yourself for all of the care that you are giving, but also in order to better serve your communities. For further dialogue regarding this presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, Buki Manalili at that email. For more information in terms of our Jesuit education in a global world masters, I highly invite you to reach out to Charlie County at that email. It has an additional certificate in Jesuit studies, which you can learn more about from that link. And of course, for any questions in terms of application or financial aid, you may contact that office. Again, it has been an honor and I hope that each of you continue to infuse your breath with the things that you value and embody in this world. Until next time, I hope you continue diving into what it means to be a person with and for others. AMDG.